Okay, so we'll just talk about some um, general motivational issues, okay? In case anybody else is feeling, uh, so I would first say don't let your, one sec. Don't let your, your self-esteem or your, your view of yourself be defined by your grades, okay? Grades are very arbitrary. All kinds of imperfections exist in the grading process. You evaluate yourself based on how much work you put in, okay? So you have the poster child, the main f few works for you to remember, essentially words like work ethic, okay? And work ethic is basically, it derives, it derives from discipline. Actually, work ethic you can have and you can, it's kind of dis difficult to dis uh, distinguish between the two. Work ethic, you've heard of Elon Musk? So Elon Musk is a multi-billionaire. He doesn't need to work at all. Okay, but he's working like 18 hours a day or 16 hours a day or something. He actually has a pillow underneath his desk in the Tesla factory. Okay, and uh, that's where he's sleeping. So he doesn't need to work like that. Okay, that's what you so that's why I always say that Elon Musk is the poster child for work ethic. Okay, if you want to explain work ethic to somebody, uh, that's what it means. Okay, so the most important thing in the world is actually work ethic. All right, so uh, so define yourself by what you have, uh, you know, substantively gained in a particular day. What have I achieved today? What what real gains? Well, grades and all these are all very superficial things. Okay, grades, exams, degrees, and all that. Nobody really cares. Once you go into the workplace, whether you got a C plus in IPM or whether somebody else got an A minus, no one really gives a damn. Okay, people. What people care about is how clear your concepts are, how well informed you are, how confident you are, how uh, you know how you're able to get things done to deliver results. Okay, whether you're a good salesman or you're a good trader or you produce great research, this is what people care about, and that has really no correlation to. I mean, the correlation is very weak. Is that clear? Okay. So uh, yes, people don't seem to be very convinced about what I'm saying. In case you're getting so I guess most of the people are not very disappointed with the grades yes. okay good so that's fine I just had a concern because uh, some people were a little bit disappointed so the other thing I would say about trading okay uh, other thing I would say that in trading this is very important to write down actually in trading because trading is a very peculiar kind of business okay so um, effort so it's very important to understand also for you when I want to make a career choice okay as to whether you want to be a trader that's uh, this kind of thing is very important it's a very very unusual kind of business okay effort not equal to is not equal to um, say uh, let's say good results I'm just gonna use shorthand here good results here by not means not necessarily okay doesn't mean that you'll always not get good results not necessarily equal to good results in I'm not going to write in the short term in short term short T means short term okay I want to just cut down my time here or even Met term is medium term okay so trading is a very peculiar kind of business it's distinguished from other businesses like if you're an accountant or a lawyer you're working for 15 hours as a lawyer you bill your client for 15 hours work is directly proportional to compensation is that clear but in trading it's not like that because markets are unpredictable you don't know what's going to happen you may work extremely hard and somebody who doesn't work much work very hard and just through luck in the short term and even in probably in the medium term okay two three years maybe you can have a run of luck good luck basically i define good luck as when you're doing stupid thing and you're not stupid things and you're not paying the price it's a useful way to think about good luck and bad luck and bad luck is when you're working extremely hard and still not getting the results okay so yesterday i gave the example of andy murray you everybody knows who andy murray is so there was at least i remember three to four years on the circuit where andy murray was one of the top three or four players on the world and he was getting to quarterfinals semifinals and he was not making it okay it was heartbreaking and you remember if you see in that wimbledon final where he got beaten by federer he actually started crying on center court he was crying that shows you the hunger to win and what did andy murray what was his uh, work ethic he's known as the most he has the most brutal training regimen on the circuit and his reaction was every time he lost a, a, a tournament he would go and step up the training regimen even more okay so that's what you uh, that's so it can happen to people like uh, and it happened to Federer also for about three or four years Federer was clearly the greatest player in history was getting to semi-finals finals and not winning the grand slams right so imagine how it must have been for him for a player like that and he kept on playing so that shows you what what can happen in life where you can have a stacking of bad luck okay bad luck is when you're working extremely hard and you're still not getting results and good luck is when you're doing stupid things and nothing happens to you you don't pay the price right so you get both 
and they usually come like there's a run okay you understand what run is theory of runs we did that run of losses when we were planning our risk yes, sir. a run so in and so you should be as a as an MBA student you should be familiar with this concept of run that you can have a run of heads even in a even in an unbiased coin you can have a run of six or seven heads in a row no big deal it doesn't mean that the coin is biased okay because that 50 percent is only for very large number of trials okay so the point is that uh, so what was I saying uh, how did I get into this bad luck good luck before that I was saying work ethic okay so I was explaining that this work ethic concept also connected to this so the point I was trying to say me mention is that so so in, in a way trading is also like that it's not like lawyering or being an accountant accountant uh, bills the client for 20 hours he does 20 hours of work bills for 20 hours get paid gets paid for 20 hours so in certain areas like sports and trading okay where the rewards are also very high but you can go through lots of periods where you don't get results so some people like so we you're feeling demotivated that you did a lot of work and you're not getting a good result but that can easily happen in trading okay you see lots of great traders who have now got into troubles they have returned all outside money they're just managing their own money it's happened to many many great there are very few traders who are continuing with uh, I think Steve Cohen is the only great trader who's not really had a bad year okay everybody else pretty much everybody else has gone into decline James Simons of Renaissance capital that I told you about Renaissance technologies okay so these are the only two people who I know that uh, who are maintain consistently good records trading records so it's very difficult so this is something you have to deal with but in the long run if we go back to this in the long run okay I'm not writing the long run in long oh, sorry in long run okay uh, in the long run you are um, if you are also working smart that is also working smart means working hard and working smart you know what working smart is right okay so working hard you may be working very hard but you might be kind of stupid like you're trying something and it's not working and you keep on trying that same thing obviously you're working hard but you're not working very smart okay so you have to have some kind of smart you have to have some instinct for the market some sense of good risk management principles etc okay so this will give you a sense of what is involved in trading it's an unusual kind of activity okay so this is what is uh, what I wanted to mention and then once again I want to so because of this kind of situation that's why I said if I go back to uh, the advice that I was giving you the other day that you need to have something beyond uh, uh, when I took off on Rajan saying that you know I don't want to come to college on a Wednesday so if you have if you want to deal with life if you want because this is what happens in life you see I gave you the stories of Andy Murray Federer and all these people right so it can easily happen to you that you're going into a bad a period of bad luck and you're not getting any results okay you're working very hard and not getting any results at that time if you all you have within you is basically what I like and what I don't like uh, you know it can crush your spirit you need to have something beyond you need to have a sense of a higher calling a sense of duty okay a duty to your own talent okay these kinds of things you need to develop okay because normally when we were at your age nobody told us all the stuff we had to figure it out along the way all right so that's why you have now you understand why the Gita says this that don't do your duty and don't worry about the consequences because if you worry about the consequences things can get so bad for so long that you would not be able to function that's why this message is there that you have to focus on doing your duty so this you'll understand hopefully uh, you understand it directly right now maybe sometime later you'll understand it really what it really means but re at least remember this okay all right so yeah so enough with the lectures any questions go back to your lab notes I've also given you a link to the Enchiridion the book by Epictetus what Epictetus is saying is not very different from Epictetus a famous Greek philosopher who was the uh, the guide who was basically the mentor to uh, Marcus Aurelius you know who Marcus Aurelius is the great Roman Emperor big great conqueror okay but he was also a philosopher so Marcus Aurelius if you guys have seen this movie called the gladiator yes sir. Russell Crowe yes, sir. so in the uh, in the early part of the gladiator there's an old man Joachim Phoenix murders an old man yes, sir. in the early part of the movie he murders his father actually so that is the figure of Marcus Aurelius the old man played by Richard Harris who gets murdered that's actually the character of Marcus Aurelius he was a great Roman Emperor but he was coached by uh, Epictetus okay so remember all that go back to your lab notes on personal effectiveness the first lecture in lab is personal effectiveness go back to that and you have a lot of these links there okay you have to develop a way of thinking about life in these terms as well so that you are resolute and you know
strong in times of uh, adversity okay let's go back now to our case we were at this point we were at so we have had a 10 minute uh, philosophy lesson i hope you didn't find it boring okay okay good now where were we yesterday and the last class where Burma had identified the question we were basically going through these questions in the case all right the uh, question in the case the second question is what we were attempting okay what are the underlying positions now we are going through this i hope everybody has read the case and you've understood now the structure of the balance sheet okay we're going to use this to try and understand all the uh, core concepts in in, in uh, corporate treasury risk management which is basically the management of a now we are learning how to manage uh, what are the key concepts for managing a passive risk book a passive risk book is what exists on a hedger's balance sheet okay not a speculator's balance sheet all right so underlying positions okay we are trying to understand that and where do we have what what do we have here the last point we reached was uh, we already figured this out and we here came here and burma told us that the underlying position so as i said here we are going to do this by looking at dollar yen the spot dollar yen okay where the dollar is the base currency we are not going to look at we are not going to form our views based on yen futures okay because nobody really does that in the market yes okay passive risk book is uh, the reason we say passive you are, you remember the distinction between speculators and hedgers so speculator starts starts with no risk okay quiet here guys why are we having some why are we having all these murmuring there should be no murmuring any questions you ask me speculators and hedgers you understand the difference okay so the speculator already starts the speculator is first transaction has to increase the total risk so he starts with zero risk and the first transaction will increase the risk and the hedger we've defined as first transaction reducing the total risk which obviously implies that there is already some risk if there is already not some positive risk how will you reduce it Yes, because we in, in deciding risk, we don't go into negative territory. We stop at zero. So it's zero and on the positive side. Okay. So is this clear from the definition itself that uh, if we are saying that the hedger has to first reduce the first transaction must reduce the total risk. That means it's obvious that uh, there has to be some positive risk on the books. That's what is going to be if it's not there, if, it, if there isn't any positive risk, if somebody is getting a zero salary, then what, how do I reduce his salary? I can't reduce a salary of zero, right? Are you following yes. that in the definition itself? There is the idea that there is some pre-existing risk on the uh, on the hedger's risk book on the hedger's balance sheet. Is this idea clear first? Right. OK, so uh, this if you want to go back to US constitutional law where they talk about the right to bear arms, OK, the right of the citizenry to bear arms shall not be infringed. So they say that it's a pre-existing right. They're talking about a pre-existing right, which shall not be infringed. So similarly here, if you're saying that the risk has to be reduced, OK, then uh, there has to be already some risk. Otherwise, what will you reduce? All right. So what is that pre-existing risk on the hedger's balance sheet? Why do we call it a passive passive risk book? Because we went through that already. You look at this balance sheet when we already went through the asset side. OK, so as SG1 and some other people told us that the positions here are long. The underlying positions here are long. So this company has no and we went through this discussion that this company has no desire to be a speculator. They are not trying to speculate on copper prices or oil prices or uh, gold prices, because if you wanted to do that, it would be much more efficient to do it through futures contracts. Right. You are uh, you can you don't have to deal with unions. You don't have to buy mining equipment equipment okay you don't have to buy drilling equipment and all that it's much cleaner you just get an in and out of positions in one click okay so in in that way this is a very clean kind of business because you can imagine you can get rid of your inventory in in a few clicks if you're running a speculators book okay if you're running an active risk book if you think of it as a kind of business like if you're running a computer hardware store you buy a whole bunch of inventory and then that technology gets outdated for some reason and then you're stuck with this inventory you have to sell it imagine the headache Whereas here, trading is a kind of business we can think of it this way if you want to think of it in inventory terms. This is a business where you can get rid of your inventory in a few clicks. Right? So if I'm holding, say, 500 oil contracts, okay, all I have to do is click, 
put in some numbers and bang out my inventory is gone in two seconds yes so this is one way of thinking about the trading business certain attractive features of the trading business uh, the speculative trading business is that uh, you can get rid of one way of looking at it you can get rid of your inventory in a few clicks okay so that reduces the risk profile of the business quite significantly because one of the problems that happens to all these brick and mortar businesses is you get stuck with inventory then you need to have a clearance sale why do these people do these clearance sales you know huge discount 50 percent everything must go right clearance sale why because they're trying to they're stuck with inventory that there's not moving the product is not moving they need to do these clearance sales to get this out so the advantage here is that you can get it out very very quickly this kind of business so if they're not if they wanted to speculate as all they wanted to do is speculate on oil prices and crude uh, copper prices and all that they should have done it through futures contracts is much more efficient okay but that's not what they want to do they feel that they have some peculiar advantage okay like there are some mergers going on now in, in the gold space with barrick gold newman mining these are very big gold companies and barrick has already eaten up one of the i think the, the standard uh, rand gold a south african mining company so uh, so there's a lot of activity happening on the gold company merger side okay so uh, the point is these people are in the business of they feel that we talked remember we talked about the value chain right so these people are they feel that they have some special expertise in extracting the efficiencies from the value chain and then they obviously capture the extra value like I told you that South Af Saudi Arabia, my, uh, Saudi Arabia's production cost for oil is basically around 18, 20 dollars. Okay, so anything above that, they have on the lowest cost of productions for uh, cost costs of production for oil, crude oil, getting it to the refinery stage. So if anything above that price, they are making money. Okay, so that's the point is that they are very efficient in extracting those uh, you know uh, efficiencies from the value chain. They're very good at it. So that's why people go into these kind of businesses. They don't go into these businesses to speculate on oil price or gold prices or copper prices they're going in there because they feel that they're very good at some because somebody has to mine the copper coppers that need it somebody has to mine the gold okay so uh, somebody has to get the oil out of the ground so who's gonna do it and they feel that we are we are good at doing this stuff and that's why they go into the business are you following so that's no, no their primary goal is not to speculate on these prices okay but because they're in this kind of business you can't help but carry some inventory you can't instantly sell everything that comes out of the ground so it's not not realistic to expect that every kind of business like this every such business is going to carry some inventory maybe less or more whatever okay so that's why now because this inventory is uh, basically uh, items that are priced in very actively traded markets like here what is your inventory crude oil all right what is your other inventory gold then you have copper all right these are uh, these are commodities your inventory is basically commodities that are very actively traded so your inventory is being continuously repriced i mean conceptually you can think of it that way the market is continuously changing the value of your inventory for better or worse right Yes, are you following? So you are not doing anything. You're just sitting there passively. You just mine some gold out of the ground. Now it's going to take you some time to sell it. It's lying on your books as in finished goods inventory. All right. And now what's happening? The price of gold is moving around and your inventory is value of your inventory. Is, if you do your if you do your balance sheet conceptually every moment, the value of your inventory is fluctuating constantly. Right. So this is a source of risk because it can go against you. <laughs> right we, sh we showed you that that yeah, we showed we did this exercise the other day and we showed you that if the value of oil drops from 57 58 to 35 the value of your oil inventory is going to drop and your accountant is next time your balance sheet has to be drawn up your accountant is going to force you to revalue the inventory down and that will lead to a loss that will lead to a reduction of your net worth remember we saw that we can see that one more time we can reduce the price of oil notice what happens to this notice here that in this case what will happen because on the asset side notice another dynamic on the asset side there is no residual factor so when you have changes to the asset side okay in this kind of balance sheet okay in this kind of balance sheet on the asset side anyway even on a normal balance sheet you don't have a residual factor on the asset side so when the asset side changes the balance sheet size itself will go up and down the size of the balance sheet what is the size of the balance sheet this 
this is the size of the when we talk about the size of the balance sheet we are talking about total assets or total liabilities okay the size of the balance sheet okay <laughs> now uh, if you change the values on the asset side the size of the balance sheet will change so notice that notice that this why is the size changing because one component of the assets is changing in value the market value of your quantity is not changing the price is changing so the market value of one component is changing which is going to lead to a change in the size of the balance sheet we refer to this as the size of the balance sheet is this clear this is the size of the balance sheet now so and then of course what will happen when the size of the balance sheet sinks uh, uh, sink, uh, um, reduces then obviously this will also reduce liabilities has to reduce total liabilities and what is the what are the two what are the two major components of total liabilities yeah so mehak has given the correct answer it's the correct high level classification is net worth and outside liabilities okay that is the right way to think about it. and then you can further decompose outside outside liabilities into all kinds of debt senior debt whatever okay senior debt subordinated debt and all that now can you change the value of the outside liabilities if there is if we if we do this as a separate paribus exercise the value of outside liabilities does not change right the total is changing and total liabilities tl is equal to ol plus nw net worth ol plus net worth so if tl is changing and ol cannot change then net worth has to adjust yes. so this is the residual part on this so you see that the net worth will also go down okay so now we are going to take this down from 5793 to 35 see what happens okay can you see that yes sir oil market value of oil component uh, one type of finished goods inventory is going down value of total assets the size of the balance sheet is shrinking and total uh, net worth is going down this is clear you should see it conceptually clearly in this way so what is this this is they didn't do anything they just took some oil out of the ground and they haven't sold it to anyone yet okay because you can't run a business like that with zero inventory very very difficult okay so uh, now what's happening here so this they did not want to speculate on oil prices that's so but they are still being hit with oil price risk this is why i say it's passive risk it's a passive risk book passive in the sense that i didn't do anything if somebody goes out onto the road and you know gets drunk and starts walking in the middle of the road and he gets hit by a car okay then you can say that this guy was asking for it okay but uh, th then but if somebody is just standing on the sidewalk and a motorcycle comes and hits him he's kind of passive but he's also getting affected he's also getting uh, the same kind of result right he's also facing the same kind of consequence now you understand what is meant by passive risk book that just by the by just by the nature of the business that you're in you are getting hit with market risks you are getting saddled with market risks uh, which uh, you really did not that was not your goal to to be basically taking on those market risks this is a kind of consequence secondary consequence of the kind of business that you're in of being in that kind of business is this clear yes everybody is clear okay so this is what we said let's uh, rewind this uh, exercise so we go back to our original values all right so everyone is clear now okay so, so we go back to the question that we were asking the other day we will recap that question that we are now in the fa in the phase of so remember where we are we are going through the questions in the case we are trying to identify all the underlying positions and in that sequence we are coming to the dollar yen uh, to the yen loan okay this is the amount the yen amount of the loan and this is the dollar yen exchange rate and this is the dollar value of the loan and we said that even though even though you will be executing your hedge transactions in the yen uh, with respect to the the management of the risk on account of the yen loan you will be executing your hedge transactions in yen, using yen futures okay where in yen futures what is the distinction the uh, distinctive uh, feature of the yen futures contract is that the yen is the base currency in the yen futures contract the yen is the base currency that's why you see these funny prices right but 
in this case when you do your analytical work that is coming out with the decision of you know what you're going to do that I would suggest you do it on the dollar yen chart because nobody really looks at uh, yen yen at dollar yen charts with yen as the base currency it's very unusual because the spot market for dollar yen is actually the spot market for currencies when you look at currencies the most liquid segment of the market is the spot market okay different markets have different situations okay in terms of liquidity uh, but uh, the in, in this currency markets the spot market is the most liquid so we would look at the dollar yen all right to come out with our views our decisions on what we have want to do all right so what is happening everybody is falling asleep the back benches are all falling asleep okay good so uh, all right so now the question is on the on uh, on the question of underlying positions we we uh, uh, in sequence we come to this question okay then what is the que we see this dollar yen loan over here and we have already decided that we are going to see this as a the risk factor that we talk about here is the dollar yen okay exchange rate okay we say that the risk factor so the underlying position is related to the krf okay the krf here is the dollar yen exchange rate uh, you can ref represent the krf as yen dollar also but when we when we take when we do the analytical work and take a view on the market on the on the krf market uh, we will do it through the dollar yen exchange rate with the dollar as the base currency so the uh, the question will arise the first question is to identify with respect to this krf you already identified that this yen dollar dollar yen exchange rate is a krf because as it moves around it creates movement on the values i mean it, it changes the balance sheet values and therefore it's a source of risk the key what to remember the source of risk a key risk factor why are we calling it a krf because it's a source of risk so now when we take our views on this so we will use uh, the dollar yen exchange rate so the question arises now with respect to the dollar yen exchange rate what is uh, magma's underlying position so what was the answer that Verma gave on the in the previous class long position, long position. okay is everyone clear about that yes, yes? Who should we ask? Shivam? Who is not? Uh, who Parul has a disagreement. Okay, okay. So let's do that. That's where we ended the class. So everyone should be clear about this. Okay. So let's look at this. Uh, the uh, so he said that the long position uh, at the, we he said that the position underlying position is long. Now let's go back to your notes. This is where the theory comes in. Uh, where are your notes? Yeah, so you have, let's go back to the top here, underlying positions, this is, right. So you understand the concept uh, of the underlying position, that it is some position, and uh, we have decided this. Now, this is the rule that you have to follow, okay? This is basically what you need to understand, okay? You can say you want to memorize it or whatever, but at least you should understand, and really it's better to understand it. There's no need to memorize every comma and full stop, but you should get the idea. The idea is quite simple, okay? How do you figure out? You need some contextual, we went through these exercises. You need some contextual knowledge. You need to know that Norway is a net exporter, or you need to know that Japan is a net importer of crude oil. So if we ask you questions like, what is Japan's position with respect to crude oil? What is Japan's underlying position? Okay, you have to have some knowledge that well, whether Japan is a, uh, as to whether Japan is a net importer or a net exporter of crude oil. Okay, you need to have that contextual knowledge. Now you see this. Just read this. This is basically the logic that you should follow for any. So you don't need to memorize anything else. Actually, you just need to get the idea here. You need to have the contextual knowledge and then you would ask yourself these questions in order to figure out whether this we already went through this exercise in the previous class so i'll go through with a little bit quickly but make sure that you understand the logic it's already in your notes so you don't need to write anything but you just need to understand basic concept we already discussed that first you find ask yourself what happens so if japan is a net importer of crude oil if crude oil prices go up does japan make money or lose money lose. they lose money then if crude oil prices fall then does japan make money or lose money make. they make money okay now you ask yourself there are only two types of positions long and short now out of these two which position ha behaves in this manner that when the market goes up you lose money and when the market goes down you make money short. it's a short position so very simple you've already learned everything now you should never forget this logic <coughs> obviously the only thing the thing i if i ask you what is uh, chile's uh, competitive uh, what is uh, chile's uh, underlying position with respect to copper 
Chile is what we normally call Chile here, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Chile is the name of the country. Okay, so what is? Does anyone know this contextual knowledge? How much markets? How much of uh, markets TV are you watching? What is Chile's uh, underlying position with respect to copper? No one knows. Okay, so Chile is home to the world's biggest copper mining company called Codelco. So the biggest copper mining company in the world is Codelco, it's a Chilean company. So Chile's underlying position with respect to copper is what? Long. Long. Because if copper prices go up, they make money. If they don't, if it goes down, they lose money. Okay, this is part of your contextual knowledge. This is also important as part of your training. That's why I've told you to continuously watch business TV all the time right when you're having dinner when you're having whatever you're doing right so uh, you uh, constantly watch business television you get all this information comes into your head this is also important for your understanding of the world along with what we call conceptual clarity this kind of framework is part of your conceptual clarity understanding how uh, you would figure out whether any entity that is given to you uh, how, how would you figure out whether that entity's position with respect to a KRF market is long or short underlying position this is how you figure it out is everyone clear probably you're clear now okay okay so um, this is basically it so you can read this on your own later but you already understood the logic okay it's all explained here in great detail so so now you can test it here as well. We go back to our sheet spreadsheet. So if the uh, assessment is correct now, because what happens? Let's say we are looking. We, uh, we're looking at. We are looking at answering this question with respect to the dollar yen market. Okay, not the yen dollar market. So we're talking about the dollar yen market. So in this case, what will happen? What you have to think about is you look at the chart and you think about what happens if the dollar yen drops. Okay, suppose it goes to 106. Okay. If it goes to 106, does this company lose money or make money? How would you figure? Go stepwise. Go stepwise. Every question is very easy if you go stepwise. One minute. You know what this company's profile is? They have a yen loan. Okay. Now we are asking this question of what is the underlying position in the dollar yen KRF? If dollar yen is the rate is one of the KRFs. And so in this KRF market, what is the underlying position for magma? That's what we're asking now. So for that, you have to have you have your framework. You figure out if the market goes down. This is the market we are talking about. If the market goes down, do they make money? And if it goes up, do they make or lose money? That question you ask and then you figure it out. Okay. Now, based on what you learned in your base asset in your very first uh, in, in your IPM, the in initial units. Okay. The market is an ex exchange of assets. A market is a venue for exchanging assets. You have a base asset and a terms asset. And when we study charts when we study charts so when the long when the long when the chart goes up here what is happening here here what is the base asset USD when the chart is going up what is happening the dollars appreciating or depreciating appreciating it's getting stronger okay because each dollar dollar used to buy around 104 yen now it's buying 108 yen so that's how with the normal scale you figure out that when the chart goes up and most charts have normal scaling okay that's why so even to understand charts okay you should understand your logic very clearly is everyone following yes. okay the logic should be very clear the stepwise logic and then you do it so many times that then instantly as soon as you look at a chart you can figure out that this is the base asset going up all right or the base asset going up. i mean the uh, what is happening in terms of each of the assets so if the dollar yen drops from 108.60 to whatever the price is here, the price is 108.54, kind of same. Okay. If we drop this to 106, is the dollar getting stronger or weaker? Weaker. Some people said stronger. Weaker. Dollar is getting weaker. Now each dollar is buying only 106 yen instead of 108.6. So if the dollar is getting weaker, then the yen is getting. Stronger. stronger okay so each yen is buying more dollars so if you have a liability here now let's we can work this exercise but i'm giving you a slightly conceptual way of slightly abstract way of thinking about it this also we have discussed in the past that your assets are your revenues although revenues are a flow concept and assets are a stock concept but if you consider everything as being made uh, all sales are cash sales and you recompute the balance sheet instantly all instantaneously all the time right that means all your cash sales are showing up as uh, cash on the balance sheet all your sales are showing up as cash on the balance sheet yes 
if you assume that all your expenses are on credit and your all your revenue sales are on cash so your cash balance is building up yes so therefore you can see a connection between revenues and assets so we say that the revenues are like assets so when you have liabilities and your asset liability mismatch so if your liability is getting stronger and your asset is getting weaker that's good or bad that's bad you're losing money right that's another way of thinking about it so when we think about asset liability mismatches another way you think about it is you look at what is happening to the value of the liability in terms of the asset here the asset is us dollars and the liability is in yen so if the yen is getting stronger and the uh, uh, the us dollar is getting weaker then your asset each unit of asset is buying only less and less liabilities so you need to retire these liabilities are you following the logic so you can just directly compare that's another way of looking at it okay we will do a mechanical yes sir uh, this means the company is uh, uh, long yeah your answer is correct but i'm taking you stepwise you're moving a little ahead like in the other class pulkit and tanya were moving ahead already to the hedge position mm -hmm. so we are not going to go so quickly we are going to go step by step we want to first make sure that everybody understands the underlying position concept for all the krfs all right yes, so that. now garvit is going to go back to sleep now that he has cracked it he is going back to sleep okay <laughs> now that's what we have to be clear about that's why that that's why i've done it uh, anyway this is how, anyway how would you any this is anyway how you would do it in the real world when you're managing risk like this you would always look at the dollar yen exchange rate okay that's where the most active market is not the yen dollar but uh, in any way that will make it more complicated for you and you'll learn more because when you actually go to hedge you'll have to hedge using the yen futures where the yen is the base currency but let's first get the underlying position clear now let's do the test okay so the answer that we already got from verma yes the other day and also from garvit today is the underlying position is long because when the dollar yen drops the dollar is getting weaker okay and uh, so therefore they are actually losing money because the assets are getting weaker the asset currency is getting weaker and the liability currency is getting stronger that's another way to think about it okay because assets are what you own liabilities are what you have to pay so if your liability currency is getting stronger and your asset currency is getting weaker then you have a problem you're losing money and now we can finally test it okay so when the dollar yen goes down you lose money when the dollar yen goes up you make money let's see that first hand on the balance sheet we're going to change this now you notice what will happen is the um, balance sheet size will not change why is that because on the liability side you have a residual concept you have a residual and uh, quantity which is the net worth so the net worth is able to absorb the changes in the other component which is the outside liabilities so the behavior on the liability side is different from the behavior on the asset side because here the asset you'll notice the total balance sheet value will not change we will make the dollar yen drop in value but the total liabilities uh, will, the balance sheet size will not change what will change is that the outside liabilities component will go up okay in particular here one of the sub components of that which is the value the dollar value of the yen loan so the market value of this will go up we make the dollar yen lock drop in value this will go up this will remain unchanged and this will drop okay so it's one is going uh, getting bigger because the total can't change one component is getting bigger the other component has to get smaller to adjust okay is this clear so let's do that we uh, probably did it once before so let's make this uh, even worse let's make it one of five so we're dropping it from 108.50 to 105 can you see that yes. market value of the liabilities went up no change did the total balance sheet side change mm -hmm. did the balance sheet side change no, no. it didn't change because increase in outside liabilities is compensated by decrease in net worth net worth that's why you see net worth is also that's why you see it's a residual concept because now what is happening is total assets remains unchanged remember the equation we should maybe write it once here also in your i don't know if it's in your main notes so this is a very important thing to understand that net worth is equals net worth equals total assets minus Is this clear so total assets remains unchanged this one goes up yes so this one also this one if, if this one remains unchanged and this one goes up then the net this one the LHS will go down 
like imagine this is 100 and this used to be say 60 now this remains 100 but this becomes say uh, 70 so earlier what was 40 net worth now will become 30 net worth yes is clear these concepts should all be 100% clear to everyone okay yeah which currency part? Uh, so no. Okay. Okay, so let's do this one more time. So what what is not clear? Okay. What is happening? We what did we do on the balance sheet just now? We dropped it. Let's reverse it now first. Then we go back to the original. Okay. We dropped it from 10854 to 105. Okay, so we dropped it from 108 roughly here to 105. Okay. We dropped it here. So when you see a chart, when the dollar yen drop, when the uh, chart drops, that means the base asset is getting weaker because the logic is this: the base asset is getting weaker because at 108, uh, at a higher point on the chart, each base asset was buying more units of terms of the terms asset. Each base, base asset was buying 10850 of the terms asset. Now we dropped it to 105. So each base asset is now buying only 105 of the terms asset as opposed to 10850. Think, yeah, don't jump ahead, go step by step. So the base asset is getting weaker. It's like gold, if the gold price drops from $1400 to $600. Okay, earlier it would cost you $600, $1,400 to buy or each unit of gold was able to buy $1,400. Now each unit of gold is able to buy only $600. So the gold is, value of gold has dropped. So we say gold is weaker in terms of dollars. Yes, same thing here. So the base asset is weaker in terms of the terms asset. Yes. So if you drop it because this is because if you of course you invert the scale then obviously things will change. This is a normal scale where the lower parts have lower values and the at the higher level at the top of the chart you have a higher value. So if you invert the scale then it will change but obviously most charts have normal scales. So that's why we say that when we look at a chart and the chart, chart drops, the chart drops means the base asset is getting weaker and the terms asset is getting stronger and the chart goes up that means the base asset is getting stronger, terms asset is getting weaker. This is clear okay and then separately you can also see it with the you can confirm that suspicion by changing the 10854 to 105 and you see that the this component goes up and this component goes down that is because of what we showed you that net worth is equal uh, net worth equals total assets minus outside liabilities okay so what used to be 100 minus 60 now becomes like 100 minus 70 so this goes from 40 to 30 it goes down yes everyone is clear all these concepts should be 100 percent clear i don't think they were 100 percent clear coming into this course were we yes. not really but it's so it's are you gaining something yes. you're gaining a better understanding make sure these understandings stay with you it's not like after you graduate and i meet you and then i ask you this question and then you can't uh, you know at your farewell party you can't answer this <laughs> okay so uh, all right so please make sure that everything you learn is completely embedded in your brain forever <coughs> okay all right so next question so is this satisfactory answered now why is the uh, underlying position for magma with respect to the dollar yen uh, krf uh, market why is it that the underlying position is long is everyone clear about that Vinotra, you're following okay okay so next question now we move on with the same question to the next krf the aussie loan all right let's let's drop an aussie chart here aussie chart okay yes Aussie. Now, uh, what is the uh, loan currency? The loan currency is Australian dollars. All right. So your liability currency is Austra Aussie. Your asset currency is USD. So now we are trying to answer this question of with respect to the Aussie US exchange rate, uh, where the Aussie is the base asset. Is our in this KRF market, which is shown in this chart, is our underlying position long or short? So who's going to answer this, Surbi? Yes. Uh, what is it? The question is clear now because you're looking at your whatsapp okay in this krf market 
in this KRF market, the Aussie loan, right? You have the Aussie loan. So we are saying that the KRF market for this is the Aussie US exchange rate and we are taking the spot. In this case, you notice there's no difference between the two ways, the two manners, uh, the two quotations, very little difference, very little difference because uh, the spot in the spot uh, FX markets, the Aussie is the base asset and in the currency futures markets also the Aussie is the base asset. So the consistency is there in the currency futures markets where in the US currency futures markets on the CME which you are going to be trading the consistent rule is that the USD must always be the terms asset. That is the rule that they have applied. But in the spot currency markets uh, which are much older they have different conventions for different currencies like in the case of the euro in the case of the cable in the case of uh, uh, aussie in the case of kiwi in all these cases the us dollar is the terms asset but for dollar swiss uh, dollar yen okay uh, dollar sing dollar rupee all these cases the dollar is the base asset so they, they are not consistent in the spot fx markets but the spot fx market is the more dominant uh, market the one which basically trades almost 5.1 trillion the total uh, fx market activity is around 5.1 trillion uh, in this in the spot and forward is 5.1 trillion per day in the, in the last according to the last survey which was done about three years ago the new one coming up soon all right so that you can imagine that's the biggest market in the world by far so what you notice here another thing that you see here because of the way that the Aussie is quoted in the spot market there is no difference in the uh, so this should be less confusing for you when you actually manage the hedge book okay because in both cases Aussie is the base asset yes, yes okay so the question coming back to survey is that who is already smiling before answering the question but um, uh, that is now what is the what is in this KRF market what is your underlying position is it long or short short okay which means you're saying that if the Aussie goes up and rises in value you'll lose money and if the Aussie goes down and drops in value you will make money okay so is her answer correct yes, sir. okay our answer is correct you can apply certain rules to check because what she's saying is what is the liability currency the liability currency is Australian dollars so if the liability currency rises in value relative to the asset currency she's saying that you'll lose money yes, and which seems to make sense right and then uh, she's saying that if the liability currency drops in value relative to the asset currency then you will make money and which is correct okay so therefore she's correct you can test it also on the numbers all right and we can make this let's say we make want to make it uh, this time let's make money we've been losing money for a long time so let's make this like 0.6 so one point uh, point six. Uh, so from uh, from uh, points whatever it was six seven eight nine or something we are making this point six. so what should happen no change will the total assets balance sheet side change no no change in balance sheet size this component of outside liabilities will decrease <coughs> decrease in value so net worth will increase okay so let's see that 1.6 1.7 you can see that no change in balance sheet size because there's a residual so that the the phenomena on the asset side and liability side are different because on the liability side you have a residual factor which is like a shock absorber kind of thing right and shock absorber and also takes positive shocks as well it absorbs both positive and negative shocks right this time it's a positive shock so it goes up in value yes mayor have you followed this clear gil are you following yes okay so uh, this is your uh, so 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 we have determined now everyone is clear about this yes of course. aussie underlying position is long with respect underlying position for magma with respect to the aussie um, krf market aussie us krf market is long yes yeah. everyone is convinced okay now we have uh, do we have it so we come to the next one the dollar loan all right so what does it say in the case obviously there's a dollar loan so the first question we can ask ourselves remember you're looking at a you're looking at market risks so what did we say that when you go in as any um, any uh, sort of uh, if we go in here and we try to load our what 
where is taxonomy and perspective let's close open this so if you are any risk if you're working as a risk manager anyway either as a uh, in a in a hedging situation or in a speculative such uh, speculative situation if you are deputed as a risk manager your first job is to look at the entire active risk book or the passive risk book and identify all the risks so you identify credit risk market risk okay and then as we said in the uh, in the notes when we discuss the taxonomy of risks we have also clarified that uh, especially when you look at market risk which is usually the biggest component of the risk generally um, so uh, especially on a trading book so what you'll have to do when you're doing market risk when you have subcategories of market risk you'll have to again look at market risk according to this framework which means you'll have to go so if you're suppose you're the chief risk manager for a big bank like JP Morgan right you'll have to look at risk by asset class <coughs> you'll have to look at risk by uh, instrument as well so if you're looking at currencies you'll have to go by each market which means you'll have to go through Aussie you'll have to go through Aussie you'll have to go through euro cable dollar yen every currency that these guys are trading if you're trading if you're analyzing the active risk book uh, the speculator book okay then in that case you have to go through every currency so first you go into first you go into uh, asset class start with one asset class okay take one instrument go through all the markets so spot currencies what it's okay guys tell us what exposures do you have in spot currencies you look at all the exposures you look at all the books you look at the dollar yen trading book the yen aussie trading book the euro the gvp and all the currency bears that they are trading everything that they are trading okay could be euro against czech corona and all these kinds of things okay all kinds of so so are you following the process are you following what you have to do as a risk manager but everywhere you're asking the same question you were you identify the krfs and you then you figure out what the underlying positions are and then of course in this case uh, the hedging will be done also by the traders I mean whatever risk management that is done they are done by the traders your job is really to take care that the risk limits are not busted but this is how you would look at risk at least you would look at the you'd go up to the point of identifying the key risk factors so you would look at currency start with one asset class take one instrument and then go into the spot currency market and look at all the key risk factors so in spot currencies your key risk factors will be dollar yen Aussie euro cable maybe dollar Canada Kiwi then uh, dollar Swiss okay euro check uh, euro sterling all these different books each of these will be a key risk factor are you following this is how the scheme will work and then you will have to proceed from here go to the currency futures book same exercise go to the currency forwards book same exercise here go instrument by instrument then once you finish this then you go here and here under options you'll have to look at the eyeballs as well now you're not just looking at in spot you're looking only at the underlying asset as the krf and you go into the options book your eyeball becomes an additional krf because the value of the positions will be affected mainly by two movements the underlying asset price movement and the eyeball movement so when you're looking at an option book your eyeball becomes an additional krf yes are you following we already studied that right because here we are talking about spot actually these are forward Aussie exposures but we are treating them as spot and then we'll figure out how later on you can actually roll spot exposures forward but these are actually because these are loans to be paid five years later so these are actually technically forward exposures but we can treat it as spot exposures and then we'll keep rolling the exposure forward the the hedge forward that we'll figure out later how we do it with FX swaps but this is the idea are you following the scheme so this is also something that you should be aware of that when you're looking at the management of okay you're not supposed to go out so I'll have to cut marks but I told you guys no you I mean I have to implement this rule so you can go out but I'll have to cut marks because uh, I mean I don't like to do this but because you guys have abused the process so um, yeah so I'll have to do I'll have to implement the rule otherwise there's no point no otherwise again everybody will start going out so okay uh, because I've, I've given you this rule now you have to finish all your work uh, water filling whatever it is that everything has to be done before the um, uh, before the class begins so during the class nobody gets to go out all right so uh, everyone has the feel of now everyone understands now how you look at market risk okay further when you look at market risk this is the exercise that you do whether you're looking at a hedgers book or a speculators book if you're a risk manager you go through asset class by each asset class 
then buy instrument then move on to the next asset class once you finish currencies then you go on to the commodities and then you do the same exercise yes everybody is following what is being discussed yes. yeah if you are a risk manager you will go through currencies this way and then you'll go through commodities this way yes okay and then equities then debt everything the whole process goes on okay till uh, the end hopefully this hundred is fine okay so we come back to our um, then we seem to have a problem so obviously we can't so on the dollar loan uh, let's ask this first question so uh, when you're talking about market risk you look at all the different types of assets right so the first question you will ask is uh, is there any currency risk on this loan yes or no on the dollar loan there's no currency risk because liability currency is equal to the asset currency the same as the asset currency so there is no currency risk there's no currency mismatch but can we say that this loan is risk free no. let's look at the case what does it say the loan is not risk free why yeah the loan is risk free because it has it does not have currency risk now you understand the importance of looking at different asset classes okay so uh, it has it does not have currency risk but it has interest rate risk yes. because interest rate risk and as we have defined your floating rate uh, where the uh, floating rate the the period for which the interest rate is periodically reset is smaller than the period the total tenor of the loan yes that's how you identify mechanically define a floating rate loan to a computer right that is the hard uh, clear cut definition we can actually make the we can add uh, something else here which is that uh, no this is the we have defined a floating rate loan the loan tenor exceeds the period for which interest rate is set and reset okay uh, repeatedly okay so another thing that we can say is usually uh, loan tenor is going to be an integer multiple you understand what that means usually loan tenor is an integer multiple you understand what that means integer multiple of uh, interest rate interest rate reset this is just rounding out the definition this is just rounding out the definition. This is all being written in your notes. Okay, interest uh, multiple of interest rate reset. Uh, mm, um, integer multiple of interest rate reset uh, frequency. Let's call it. Okay. So again, the very very uh, you can see the, how the definition is very precise. A computer will understand this. So which means essentially what this all this this, this means is this part of the statement. I'll just explain it in case anybody is confused by it. All that this means is that the loan if the loan tenor is five years the interest rate reset frequency is going to be three months or six months or one year okay so that means uh, five divided by 0 0.25 is an integer because 0 0.2 for three months is like 0 0.25 years right six months is 0 0.5 years so five divided by 0 0.5 is a integer okay that's what it means so usually that's what you end up seeing that you have a, a loan tenor but this is this statement is only true at the time that the loan is disbursed it is not necessarily true when at the time that you come in to manage the risk on the loan are you able to follow the difference between the two this statement is only true Loan is dispersed and also on which other po at which other points will the statement be true? This statement, this concept. Disbursed means first the loan is sanctioned that Mayhuk is allowed to borrow hundred million dollars. Then next the loan is disbursed means we credit your account with hundred million dollars. That's the disbursement of the loan. Okay, that's when the interest starts counting the interest clock starts running okay and which other time this is also an important concept in bond pricing and swap pricing at is my are you guys following what is being discussed here yes i try to give a tighter tight definition of a floating rate loan the definition is that uh, the loan tenor exceeds the interest rate reset frequency 
So loan tenors say five years, interest rate reset frequency is three months. That's one. And the second, we are adding to that definition a little bit that we are saying that usually the loan tenor is an integer multiple of the interest rate reset frequency. So I've given you those examples. Everyone understand the statement? Integer multiple. Okay. Now this statement is only true at the time that the loan is disbursed and at certain other points of time. Is my question clear now? Yes. What is the answer to my question? At which other points of time is the statement going to be true? Is the question clear? <laughs> I have to make sure the question is clear, otherwise... What? This has an important implication for bond pricing because we will have swap pricing on, on certain dates the price will be equal to par because of the, when you're pricing floating rate notes and things like that. Okay, and on the yes, five year loan with a three month reset period. 5 divided by 0 0.25, 3 months is 0 0.25 years. 5 divided by 0 0.25 is an integer multiple, is an integer. Okay, so the loan tenor is an integer multiple of the interest rate reset frequency. But if I look at this loan after it has been on the books for 3 years, now there are exactly 2 years to go and 4 more resets are there, uh, are left, 4 more interest rate resets are left. Okay, and today I see the reset for the first of those four periods. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes? No? Yes? No? No. Okay, good. That's what I want. You need to have give me a clear answer. So, uh, this is what we need. Okay. All right. So, let's say these are not equal uh, rows. Why do I have such a big row here? Okay. Let's go somewhere here and do this okay so the loan tenor is let's say we have a shorter loan okay uh, let's have a shorter loan tenor we will have it one two three four five six okay so let's have a three-year loan all right so this is your loan tenor now your interest is being reset every year uh, every three uh, uh, let's say half yearly half yearly resets okay so the statement is true at this point when we are at this point the statement is true because uh, there are uh, what eight uh, there are uh, six resets so 0 0.5 anyway say uh, the um, the uh, multiple is going to be six because you have three years and you have divided three divided by 0 0.5 is six so it's in the the integer multiple is six at the beginning of the loan yes, but this statement is also true at any of these points at this point here the beginning of the loan it's also true at this point at the interest rate at the start on the interest rate reset dates next interest rate reset date is here everyone can see my cursor next rate re reset date is here next reset date is here next reset date is here yes all right so uh, that's why i said this has an important this concept has an important application to pricing of bonds and swaps uh, so, which which we are probably not going to have time to get into in our courses, but you should understand this concept. So, the statement that I made that it's an integer multiple of the interest rate reset period is also true on every interest rate reset date. Because at this point, what do I have? I have one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So basically, I have uh, so so the the uh, the uh, integer multiple at this point is five. At this point, the integer multiple is four yes because there are like uh, it's so, so the statement is true at all of these uh, periods of time yes that the integer multiple of the remaining pe uh, periods are the the remaining interest rate periods that are there left in the if you take the remaining interest rate periods left in the loan this statement will be true on the interest rate reset dates yes. is this clear okay so I should have mentioned inter the remaining interest rate periods okay this uh, let's look at it this way you don't you know Let's change the statement a little bit. Integer multiple of uh, reset frequency or yeah okay so reset frequency is the same as the re the period okay so what am I saying that the statement is true um, of the remaining interest rate reset um, where well, we should change this word to periods 
tenor and we are using t tenor and period okay are you following here this is what i'm trying to say here that the statement is true here because the number of remaining interest rate reset periods is one two three four five six so and this is three so three divided by uh, uh, the uh, zero point uh, uh, two five okay the period is uh, you have an integer multiple and this statement is also true at each of the interest rate reset periods is this clear okay that's all we are trying to say here okay all right so let's move on to the next uh, point okay Gurvith has already started uh, getting restless. Okay. And a little bit early even for you. Okay. All right, guys. What is the thing? Uh, so, so what is the, uh, what is the, um, let's, let's, let's uh, get this three month. Uh, now, let me try, try and get LIBOR. Where is LIBOR? Oh, we tried this the other day. It's not working. Okay, so we have uh, let's we have to go back to our Fred chart. Okay, but so the risk. So what would we call the risk factor here? What is the KRF on the dollar loan? Yeah, interest rate. So we would say the risk factor here is a three-month U.S. dollar LIBOR right let's go into this rates um, so the krf is three and three month where are the interest rates <laughs> What is the uh, LIBOR rates? We can get uh, we have LIBOR for oh my god this is not going to load if we have a uh, interest rate if we have a Okay, so we would say that the the KRF here is three month US dollar LIBOR. All right, KRF is three month US dollar LIBOR. Okay, and what is the uh, underlying position with respect to three month US dollar LIBOR? Okay, here we have to cut marks for uh, Shreya and Shurbi talking. Middle seats. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we? Okay. So, uh, is this clear? The KRF here is an interest rate. It's it's a three month US dollar LIBOR. Okay. Please note also that you can actually have. Uh, for one uh, particular uh, exposure on the balance sheet, you can actually have two KRFs. We have not given this sign of situation here. But if, now these are fixed rate loans. These Aussie loans are fixed rate loans and the yen rain is also a fixed rate loan. This is given for sake of simplicity. But please understand that you could have, uh, uh, for one balance sheet item, you could actually have two risk factors. Because you could have this yen loan on a floating rate basis based on three month yen LIBOR. In that case, you would have uh, both currency risk because the asset currency and the liability currency don't match. So you have currency risk as well. But and you also on top of that, because the same item on the balance sheet, you also have interest rate risk because there is three month yen LIBOR, which means the yen interest liability itself is not clear except at the start of the loan for three months or what in this case is three month yen LIBOR. Is this clear that you have a loan of this uh, tenor? Okay, you have a loan of this kind of tenor 
uh, a long period of a loan but your interest rate is clear on interest liability is clear only for one pe reset free period at a time yes, and then here it's not clear again all these things what you're going to pay over here this is not clear so there are two sources of risk on this balance uh, if if this item had been uh, and this is one of the problems we have discussed in the case one of the questions that is asked because the CEO wants to swap this into a floating rate he wants to swap this into a floating rate loan so therefore uh, that would create another if he were to do that that would create another KRF on account of the same balance sheet item so understand that when you combine what you see on the dollar dollar loan with what you have seen on the yen and the Aussie loans here you had currency risk but no interest rate risk mm -hmm. because these are fixed rate loans that's the total interest liability is known for the over the entire tenor of the loan the total interest liability is clear because it's a fixed rate loan yes, sir. but here in this case you have this so, but if it were these these were floating rate loans then the there would have been two risk factors two krfs on account of the same balance sheet item there would be a dollar yen exchange rate risk and there would have been a three month yen libor exchange rate risk, uh interest rate risk right two krfs would have been there in this case we have only one krf here which is uh the uh the three month us dollar libor okay now let's get through this question of what is the underlying position Bunit? what is now that we've identified the three month dollar libor is the three month us dollar libor is the uh, krf on account of this balance sheet item okay the dollar loan the floating rate dollar loan now the question has to be asked what is magma's underlying position with respect to three month dollar libor yes punit short okay which means you're saying that if dollar libor rises they will lose money and if dollar libor falls they will make money okay does that make sense yes, can everyone see the scale yes, on the list and now that the class is about to end everybody is yes, able to sir. see the scale yes, okay <laughs> okay so uh, i'll make the scale even bigger because i don't think it's very clear <laughs> one minute <laughs> We still have time. There are three minutes. Three minutes are left. Be quiet. Be quiet. One minute. Not one minute, but three minutes. Okay. So is Puneet correct? Yes, sir. If if the if when yen LIBOR is rising, if their interest rate used to be say one and one point one three, uh, uh, sorry, not do, not yen LIBOR but dollar LIBOR, and then if it rises rapidly, say to five point three seven. Then their total interest liability has suddenly gone up right yes, so for one period they were paying less for here they were paying less in the first period then next period they're paying more and the next period they're again paying more again they are paying more here more and more and more it keeps on rising yes, so their total interest liability the they, first of all they're not able to predict it at the outset they don't know what the total will be and every period the total interest liability for the three months seems to keep on increasing because three month dollar libor is going up okay so that's bad for the company they're losing money so Puneet is correct so with respect to three month us dollar libor which is one of the krfs okay the krf for the dollar loan the floating rate dollar loan with respect to that krf their underlying position is short okay and so what will you do if you want to now we have not got into that aspect of the uh, discussion yet but we have covered these so far one minute okay so we have covered all these right now let's quickly start about the uh, start to think about what we are going to do we still have about one and a half uh, one one minute or so a little bit more than that just on the us let's get the discussion started if you are afraid if let's say Puneet looks at the chart and he is very afraid that he's standing at this kind of period please pay attention if Puneet is the risk manager and he's very afraid that we are going to go into this kind of phase and dollar LIBOR is going to keep on rising okay so what is he going to do to the euro dollar future remember he has to hedge using euro dollar futures we went through this discussion in the class before remember when i showed you how you use the fair value model the price versus fair value comparison you make a projection for your uh, LIBOR setting and then based on that you buy or sell the euro dollar futures because the market you compare the market price of the euro dollar futures to the fair value your forecast based fair value right so what will Puneet do let me just quickly get you started on that in initially just few seconds left what he will do is suppose where were we yeah suppose that uh, the current level of dollar LIBOR is 1.885 
follow this discussion okay we are connecting it to the hedge position it's 1.8 Puneet forecast that the next uh, figure is going to be 1.2.15 three month dollar LIBOR will move from 1.885 to 2.15 now the fair value of the um, futures contract of the euro dollar futures contract if Puneet's view is correct should be actually 97.85 the current market price is 98.11 okay so the market is predicting a fix of 1.885 in the cash market for three month euro dollar deposits but Puneet feels that the fixing will be actually 2.15 so he has a very bullish view on the euro dollar futures deposit rate so the fair value according to Puneet's forecast is 97.85 market price is 98.11 so Puneet will buy or sell the euro dollar futures market price is higher than fair value forecast based fair value are you following this forecast based fair value market price is higher than fair value so he will sell he will sell the uh, euro dollar futures okay this is clear okay you're done